I'd like to appeal to you all from the start to approach this subject with an open mind. You may come from a variety of backgrounds and belief systems, and some of what you hear tonight may clash with what you are accustomed to. Please listen carefully and hear the matter through. Many years ago, I myself came from a quite mixed up way of thinking about this subject. But as a young man, I was blessed with the opportunity to investigate the matter thoroughly, to contemplate this Bible message. And that's the message that we want to share with you tonight, the message of the Bible. So first of all, I want to state that when we appeal to the Bible, we accept its authority as the word of God, which God inspired men to record. And I'd like you to come with me to Second of Timothy and chapter 3 to begin with. Now, all of these quotes are going to be up on the screen. So if you're not familiar with your Bible, you can just follow along. And uh, I'd encourage you to do that and just try to take this in. So Second of Timothy chapter 3, commencing at verse 14, says... But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, another way of describing the Bible, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And here's our key passage about inspiration. Paul says... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible has been written for us by God to make us wise unto the salvation which he is offering in Christ Jesus. So with that as an introduction, we're now going to pretty much base our remarks on the Bible. Apart from at the end, I'm going to refer to a couple of other sources as we contemplate a couple of uh, different views. So let's now address our subject question, and we'll do this in order. So firstly, when will there be life after death? Now, we read 1 Corinthians 15, and the first 23 verses. And, and 1 Corinthians 15 answers this question very satisfactorily. Now, part of the reason that Paul wrote this chapter was because amongst the first century believers at Corinth, there had arisen some confusion about the subject. These are the very earliest times of Christianity. We are only some decades, a few decades after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're just going to re-look at some of the verses that were just read for us. Verses 1 to 4, first of all. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Actually, take note that this is the gospel message or part of it. We're going to come back to that subject right at the end of our talk tonight. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." We're not going to talk about that aspect of according to the scriptures tonight, but that's an interesting avenue for you to explore later. Christ died for our sins according to the Old Testament prophecies. That's what he's referring to there when he says according to the scriptures. Now, this is part of, as I said, the gospel message. Christ died for our sins he was buried and he rose again the third day. Now, the confusion that arose in Corinth 
he mentions in verse 12 of this chapter. You may have that chapter open still in your laps. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So there was some confusion amongst this group of believers at Corinth. And the answer comes back from verses 20 to 23. The apostle wrote, Now is Christ risen from the dead. And, and we're not going to look at the whole chapter, but you read earlier, there were more than 500 witnesses to that fact that he had risen from the dead. So the apostle now is just reaffirming that. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What he means there is explained in the next verse. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Adam sinned. We're not going back to that Bible record tonight. As a result of that sin, we inherit a dying nature. We all die. But in Christ, there is hope. We have to find out about getting into Christ and believing this gospel that the apostle spoke about in verses 1 to 4. Now, here's the, 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 uh, the key verse as when we talk about when will there be life after death. He says, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, he's now. He has risen from the dead. He has life after death. But afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. So this is one of hundreds of passages in the Bible that talk about the coming or the return of Jesus Christ. And life after death for the followers of Christ, for those that are Christ's, as Paul puts it here, will be at his coming, at his return. So resurrection to life is going to happen at a time which is still future. The coming of Christ. Now this dovetails really, um, really well into another passage where the inspired apostle was clearing up some confusion at another meeting. Well, I've just put that highlighting there. So Christ was now and Christ is the first fruits and afterward there will be a resurrection to life after death for those who are Christ's at his coming. So Paul also wrote later to Timothy in this second letter to Timothy in chapter 2, verses 15 to 18. And he encouraged Timothy to do this, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker or a cancer, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and they overthrow the faith of some. So these people, Hymenius and Philetus, they had been believers, but now they have erred. They've been looking at profane and vain babblings rather than concentrating their attention on the inspired word of God. And that's led them to this misunderstanding that the resurrection is past already. And by, by, by understanding that and teaching that, they were overthrowing the faith of some. So the apostles made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23 that the resurrection is yet future. Talking about the resurrection in the past is overthrowing the faith. It's erring from the truth. Now, I want you to just understand at this juncture that in the, the resurrection that we're talking about in the future is the resurrection that's going to result in life eternal for those who are Christ's at his coming. 
there have been other resurrections. There have been people raised from the dead, and we're going to talk about one right now. But those were temporary. They were not part of God's ultimate plan of raising to life eternal they that are Christ's at his coming in the future. So let's turn to that passage now. If you wish, turn in your Bibles or otherwise follow along. We're going to look at John chapter 11. Here's an example of a resurrection that happened 2,000 years ago. John chapter 11, commencing at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. The dead was a man named Lazarus. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So the Lord Jesus Christ said a short prayer to his Father in heaven. And then he said this in verse 43, when he had thus spoken to his Father, then he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, unto them, sorry, loose him and let him go. Now, as I said, this was a temporary thing. Lazarus died again at some stage later, and he lies in the grave now, awaiting that time that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, when Christ will return and when they that are Christ's will be raised to life at that, at that time. Just note those words. It was when the Lord cried with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth, that he that was dead came forth. We're now going to turn to the second part of our question, life after death, how? You might like to turn back to that passage in your Bible, John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 21. For as the Father raiseth, raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, quickeneth is an old English word which means to give life to. We still use it today when, when, a, when a baby is conceived in a womb and when mum starts to feel sick, with um, uh, this, you know, she's uh, many women actually start to vomit and feel absolutely terrible. It's because the child has quickened. They say it's come to life. So that's what that word means. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and gives them life, so even so the Son quickeneth whom He will. Verse twenty six. For as the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Now, particularly note these next couple of verses. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So did you notice that the resurrection happens when he utters his voice? They hear his voice and they come forth. I'm just going to put up again a couple of verses from chapter 11 that we looked at a moment ago so that you can see both of them together on the screen. There it is. John 11, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the time is coming in the which those who are in those graves are going to hear his voice. 
And just as Lazarus came forth, so they will come forth in that day. So really the answer to this question, life after death, how, is very simply because God can do that which is humanly impossible and he has given that power to the Lord Jesus Christ to give life to whomsoever he will. That's the simple question. And we have biblical evidence that that has happened already in the past. So that's very simply the when and the how. Now let's just turn to why. Why life after death? Well, the same passage that we're in, John 5, verses 28 and 29 answers that as well. Let's read it again. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Here's the reason why. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So if you hark uh, hark back to, uh, or take your minds back to our reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, It spoke about how they that are Christ's will have life at his coming. That's the same group here described as they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. So there is going to be a process of of assessment done. There's going to be a resurrection and then a process of assessment. Have you or I done good or have you or I done good? done evil. Here's another passage that touches on this subject. The Apostle um, Paul, Acts chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. This I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, he's having an argument with um, some people who were part of a, a Jewish movement called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. But Paul did. And Paul said, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. And now he's talking about some Pharisees who are another group, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So there will be a resurrection of the dead. No question. It's taught all over the the Bible. But why? Because there's going to be an assessment made and a decision made. Were you just or were you unjust? Now, as I said, it's all over the Bible. But notice in um, in verse 14 there that the Apostle Paul says that he believes all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Well, the law is a reference to the first five books of the Bible. And that talks about resurrection as well. But then in the prophets, we're going to turn to one of those prophets, our our attention to one of those prophets now. And that's the prophet Daniel. If you you wish to, turn up Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Which says... And at that time, we haven't got time to go into too much about that, but we'll just keep reading and you'll see the significance of this in the context of our subject tonight. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time... Thy people, and he's referring this to, he's speaking to Daniel the prophet. At that time, thy people, Daniel, shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They'll be given 
a new life like never before. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So you see the the consistency of the Bible message. There's going to be a resurrection and some will be raised to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the why of the resurrection. Notice also we learn one other thing from, um, from this tonight, this passage. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Not all of them, many of them. And that, that's a subject that um, we're not going to delve into too much, but understand that to be a part of those who are the many, we need to have formed some relationship with God. We need to have formed some relationship with God that makes us accountable for him to raise us from the dead and assess whether we were just or unjust whether we're going to be given everlasting life or whether we're going to be relegated to shame and contempt. So, as we've said, there are these two classes. So notice we've been through three passages. John 5, Acts 24, Daniel 12. They've all spoken about the same thing, a resurrection to life, followed by a judgment of the individuals so resurrected. They that have done good receive life. They that have done evil receive condemnation. Now let's actually dig down a little deeper now into really why there's going to be life after death. It's because the creator of this universe wants to give life to people who want to be like him, who want to reflect his character. Now, we're just going to explore this for a bit to to really dig into life after death. Why? Consider these two passages. Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. Simeon hath, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. Gentiles is is just a name for non-Jewish people. So the gospel went first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles or the non-Jews. And God is visiting the Gentiles, of which we are. We are the part of the Gentiles. What did he do that for? Why did he send that gospel message out through the Apostle Paul and all all the, uh, the servants of God who followed him? He did it to take out of them a people for his name. And essentially, God's name means, I will be. I've got a plan and I'm going to become something. And he actually wants to extend himself into people who want to share in his beautiful characteristics. And notice this other passage, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Do you remember we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 2 earlier and there were a group who started to teach wrong things. They erred concerning the truth and they overthrew the faith of some. And the Apostle Paul said that's a serious matter because without faith it's impossible to please God. All right? So we've got to be very careful how we go about our our lives together with other believers encouraging others to to build this faith, this true faith in God. And what else does this verse say? It says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he actually exists, and secondly, they've got to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And it's only time and, and reading of the Scriptures and meditating on the the scriptures or the Bible that will allow you to actually reach that conclusion, to confidently reach the conclusion that God really is calling out a people for his name and that he really is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
So that's a bit more of the why. Now we're going to go a little bit further with it. Currently in heaven, there are immortal beings that we call angels. And we're told that those angels are God's representatives who perfectly do his will. They cannot die. And they have, uh, they've been given immense power. And God is calling out a people, as Acts says, from this creation. He's calling them out to be involved that he might reward them with being made like unto the angels. We're going to have a look at a passage, quite a lengthy passage now, in Luke chapter 20. So if you'd like to turn to Luke 20 and have that open in your Bible, do so by all means. In Luke 20, we're going to start reading from verse 27. Now, just bear with me because this is, um, I just need to read these verses as background to what, what the Lord Jesus Christ says at the end. So there came to him, this is to the Lord Jesus, certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. They were a group of Jews who had decided that there was no resurrection, that this life held all the rewards that there possibly could be, and that when you died, you were laid in the grave, and that was, that was the end of matter. Finito. And the Lord is going to say, that is wrong. So let's just see how he does it. But they came to him with, with an argument which they thought would trip him up, which would confuse him. They said, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die having a wife and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Let me explain that simply. That's saying that under the law of Moses, if I took a wife, got married, and then something happened to me, I was killed in an accident, there were no children from the marriage, the law of Moses required that if I had a brother, that he should take my wife as his own wife and raise up a child that would succeed in my name. Okay? That was the law of Moses. Now, these Sadducees, in their argument to the Lord, go on to say, There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children. And so the second brother took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Verse 33, Therefore they said, In the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? The seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. That's something for this time of creation that we're in right now. But... What you don't understand is this, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. In a comparative record to this gospel record in Luke, he says to these uh, Sadducees that they did greatly err in their misunderstanding of Scripture. Okay, so see the, how this is dovetailing into passages that we've already looked at. They which shall be accounted worthy. They are, in Acts 24 terms, the just. They will be made like unto the angels, they will not be able to die anymore. They will be the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. The children of God. That's a really a key phrase for something that we're just about to also touch on now. So as I said, God is calling us, inviting us 
to be a part of this people for his name. He's inviting us to share in this through the gospel message. Now recall, when we started tonight, we started in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4, where he said, Brethren, I declare unto you that gospel which I preached unto you, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's an important part of the gospel. But there's more to the gospel. This is a passage, feel free to turn it up, Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, which says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify, now that really means that he would account right the heathen or the nations through faith. So we come to God from the nations, from the Gentiles, and we're not right. We come in our sins. But the scripture foresaw that God would, 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 had found a way and he would make right the nations through faith. And foreseeing that, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So this gospel message goes on. Now to Abraham and his seed, says verse 16, were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And verses 26 to 29, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Notice the word promises and promise. So this is impacting on another passage we've already looked at. In 1 Corinthians 15, when we were addressing the when subject, you'll recall that the scripture said, afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Now this is addressing how we can become Christ's. We have to believe the things that were promised to Abraham, Abraham, and we need to be baptised into Jesus Christ. And as a result of those things, the last verse says, verse 29, then we will be Christ's. They that are Christ's at his coming. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We can share in these promises that God has made. Now remember, faith is the important thing. We have to have faith, but that's been now, our understanding has been expanded. It's faith in the things that God has taught. It's faith in that which was preached to Abram, Galatians 3. It's faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. So there's a level of understanding required that we then have to have faith in those things that we've come to understand. And I want you to notice that Hebrews chapter 11, which we haven't got time to, to go through in detail, but in that chapter, the Apostle Paul goes through a, a list of faithful people through time. He mentions people like Abel and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and the list goes on and at the very end of the chapter he says this 
And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They haven't got life after death yet. Because, verse 40 says, God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. So, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, the prophets, all of those faithful people, Sarah, they're going to be part of that group that the apostles, apostle mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, they that are Christ's at his coming. And they'll all be given life after death at that juncture. Now, we're going to come back and summarise that in a few minutes to, to conclude our address tonight. But very briefly now, I just want to consider some challenges to the biblical explanation which we've considered. Because some of you um, may be thinking, but doesn't the Bible teach that man has an immortal soul? And when I was doing my early research into the teachings of the Bible, I was trying to have an open mind. And I wrote away for a correspondence course. This is the correspondence course. I've still got it. It's called The Catholic Religion, A Course of 20 Lessons. And I'll now quote from lesson one of that course. Belief in the immortality of the human soul comes easy to Christians. We believe that God has told us our souls are immortal, made by God to go on to a new and greater life after death. No further proof is necessary for any of us who believe in an all-powerful God who has spoken to us in Christ. Well, 20 years old and as sceptical as all get out, I thought, no proof is necessary. You've got to be kidding. Where at least are the passages in the Bible that support that assertion? As a sceptic, as a young man, I was not at all satisfied with that. The lesson goes on to describe how common sense teaches people that they have this soul within them that will live on even after their bodies are laid in the grave. And three main reasons were put forward. One, people's ability to love. And in a bit more detail, the booklet says, people's ability to love other people or to delight in beautiful things is evidence of a spiritual power within them that cannot die. People's ability to think abstractly about things is claimed as evidence that people must have a spiritual undying power within them. And thirdly, people's ability to invent things shows that they cannot simply be a natural person that ability comes from the spiritual part of the person which, quote, cannot be destroyed and lasts forever, unquote. Now, I was contemplating that all those years ago and then someone asked me to have a look at this passage. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6 and Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. Let's read that together. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Verse 10. Here's the advice of Solomon. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, now, while you've got opportunity, do it with thy might, because there is no work, nor device, 
nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So there's not a lot of biblical evidence, none in fact, for love proving that we've got an immortal soul. The Bible says that our love, our hatred and our envy will perish. There's, not, there's no biblical evidence that being able to think abstractly or show wisdom to invent things shows that we've got an immortal soul because Solomon said, push on with things while you've got opportunity now because there's no work, device, knowledge nor wisdom in the grave. So... Perhaps to try and see if we can clear this up without going into too, too much detail, we'll go to one other um, section of Scripture, and that's right back in Genesis chapter 2. If you'll turn with me there, please. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Now, this is a passage which is quoted sometimes by people who believe that We have within us an immortal soul. And the passage is in the context of of the creation record. And we read there, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So there you are, says the believer, in the immortality of the soul. He's a living soul. It's special. It's something different. What was the life-giving ingredient described in verse 7? We'll see. Let's read it again carefully. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So there's a man that's been formed out of the dust. And God breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So the breath of life is the thing that gives the life to that body. Okay? Now compare Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 2 verse 7 with Genesis 7 verses 21 and 22. Genesis 7 is about the record of the flood. And in that flood, verses 21 and 22 describe the horrific results of that catastrophe, which were that, quote, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. So all of these creatures, the birds, the cattle, the creeping things, and the people, they were all animated by the breath of of life and it was taken up from them and they died so ladies and gentlemen there's far more evidence than this but tonight is an introduction to this subject but here's the truth of the bible souls are not immortal a living soul when man was made a living soul He was made simply a living being. A being which, when it breathes its last, ceases to live. And you might like to use a Bible concordance to follow through the word soul after tonight. Get hold of a Bible concordance. If you you can't find one in print or you'd rather do it online, that there are many options that you can use online to do this. Use a Bible concordance and follow through the word soul and you'll find that souls are born. Souls die. Souls eat 
and drink and souls can be destroyed. That's Bible language about souls. And I'll challenge you to find anywhere in the Bible the phrase, the two-word phrase, immortal soul. I contend you won't be able to find it. This is the true teaching of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. We're not going to live on after death. We won't be going to heaven, nor will we be going to some place of the damned. If we're not alive when Jesus Christ returns, we'll be laid in the grave and our only hope for life after death will be a resurrection from the dead and then being found amongst the just by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's summarise what we've, we've tried to cover in our address tonight. Life after death, when, how and why. When? At the return of Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ has that life now. He is the first fruits and his followers will get that at his coming. They that are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23. How will life come? Well, it will come by a resurrection. First to mortality, the kind of life that we have right now, followed by a judgment and a change to immortality, a change to life like the angels now possess for those found to be the true followers of Jesus Christ. And life after death, why? Why? To extend the glory of the Creator. He is calling out of this creation a people for his name. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight has been a really brief look at this subject. There is so much more. But we hope that what you've heard tonight has whet your appetite and that you will look into this further. Because the hope of the Bible is tangible, it's real, God really is inviting people to be a part of his plan. So please continue in your search for understanding of the wonderful truths of the Bible. And our hope and prayer is that all of us might be found amongst the just at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and experience that life that we've mentioned tonight, life like never before, made like unto the angels. Thank you.